This video is part two of my account of the Battle of Rangaruri. If you've not watched part one yet, please watch it first here. Where I left off, it was 4.45pm on the 20th of November 1863. The British gunboats had been unable to deliver their artillery bombardment and had not unloaded their troops behind the Maori lines as planned. General Cameron had decided not to wait any longer and had just ordered his main force of troops to launch a frontal attack on the Pa. Gamble's account continues. At about 50 yards, the skirmishers were instructed to halt to cover the ladder party in planting. While the 65th was scaling on the left, the 12th and 14th were to keep the fire down in the centre. Not present in the official accounts, but mentioned by a colonial soldier with the force, W.G. Mayer, when the advance was sounded, the 65th descended to the tea tree on the left, and cowed by the heavy fire, lay down. While the 14th went on, three of their officers, Austin, Phelps and Murphy, falling before they got near the Great Ditch. St. Hill, General Cameron's aide-de-camp, went to his regiment and said, I'm ashamed of you, 65th. Close to your right and charge, and told Colonel Austin to do the same with the 12th and 14th. The 12th and 14th regiments took a serious pounding. Clearly, the defenders had concentrated their forces in the central redoubt. The 65th pushed onwards as planned, planted their ladders, and forced their way into the par. A journalist who was travelling with the troops commented, The guns having ceased fire, they again advanced. The ladders were placed over the ditch and onto the parapet on the left flank and our brave fellows scrambled over in the face of a hot fire from the enemy behind. Private Gallagher of the 65th unfurled the flag belonging to the regiment and planted it on the parapet, bayoneting a Maori on the other side, and then shot a Maori down in almost less time than it takes to tell of it. The enemy were either quickly shot, bayoneted, or compelled to fly from the spot, and many were shot down in their flight. The storming party passed the front line and wheeled up towards the central redoubt, reinforced at that time by the reserve, when they ran into the same sort of heavy musket fire that the 12th and 14th had just endured, directed upon them from the hook-shaped work that enfiladed the main line. Eventually they took this position, pushing right up to the redoubt itself, but they could not get in. The troops stopped assaulting after taking heavy losses and settled in, taking cover in the works around the redoubt. As this happened, the 40th were finally able to make their landing. They got ashore, and together with some of the 65th who had passed the main line, assaulted the rear works, one after the other, finally seizing the high hill at the back of the par that commanded the lake, allowing them to fire upon any Maori trying to escape, including women and children. Something that they did until darkness fell, leaving many dead in the lake and the surrounding swamps. One canoe was targeted by the naval six-pound Armstrong gun, and was upset by a shell bursting immediately over it. Cameron's force was now surrounding the central redoubt on three sides, and anyone trying to retreat from the remaining side would have to run the gauntlet of rifle fire from the 40th up on the hill. The fortifications of the central redoubt of the par had proved to be deceptively formidable, and the ladders that the troops had brought with them were far too short to span their defensive ditch. With all his regular forces forming this cordon and largely pinned down, Cameron made a controversial decision in ordering two further assaults on the central redoubt, which was defended by over 200 warriors at this point. I suspect that Cameron feared that the Maori garrison would simply slip away in the night, leaving behind an empty par, only to face the British again upriver. During the main assault, the 65th had attempted to force their way into the narrow entrance at the rear of the redoubt, and faced a fierce fire concentrated through that gap. Cameron ordered his Royal Artillery gun crews, 36 men, commanded by Captain Mercer, to assault that entrance again. They are armed with revolvers and swords, useful weapons for such close quarters, but gunners are not shock troops. And the small force was repulsed after six of their number were killed or wounded, including Mercer, who fell in that narrow entrance. Mercer lay there, mortally wounded, with a severe wound to his jaw and tongue, in a vulnerable position exposed to fire from both sides. When Teo Reori, um, one of the Maori defenders, took it upon himself to try and save Mercer's life. He braved the crossfire to leave the redoubt 
and drag Mercer to a sheltered spot on the far side of the entrance. Teo Reary was shot three times for his trouble. Lieutenant Picard and Assistant Surgeon William Temple of the Royal Artillery braved the same crossfire to get where Teo Reary had left Mercer, and tend to the other wounded men. Picard crossed the entrance again and again to bring the men water. Eventually the British were able to dig a trench out to Mercer, block the entrance with planks and soil, and recover the mortally wounded officer. Picard and Temple would both receive the Victoria Cross for their actions. Cameron ordered one final assault, this time conducted by the only fresh troops he had left, the naval crews of the gunboats. Ninety seamen, armed with revolvers and cutlasses, led by Commander Main of the HMS Eclipse. Midshipman Foljam wrote, The general then sent a message to the Commodore, saying that the natives were caged up, and firing from behind their fern on our men, and that the soldiers could not go in. So he sent for the blue jackets without rifles, and armed only with cutlasses and revolvers. We went straight up to the redoubt and charged them. The Maoris only showed their heads for a second, and then bobbed down, and let fly at us without taking much aim. I made a rush through the fire and jumped into the ditch. We made several attempts to get over the earthwork, but failed. After losing 15 men killed or wounded, a party of the seamen subsequently tried to toss a number of hand grenades in the works, but they had little effect. Night fell, and the Maori evacuated their wounded, including Te Farapu and King Tafia, who escaped across the lake under cover of darkness, while the remainder of the garrison kept up a steady fire with the British troops. The journalist with them reported, It was now night, and the place was found too strong to storm. A mine was therefore commenced from the ditch on the left, which ran close under the left side of the redoubt. After an hour's labour, the soil was found to be too sandy for this work, the roof of the mine falling in. A breach was therefore commenced to be made, while shells were pitched into the redoubt from a small Cohen mortar that had been brought up, and hand grenades were thrown inside. Now we come to the greatest controversy of the battle. At sunrise on the 21st, as the British were undermining the parapet of the central redoubt, the Maori defenders raised the white flag. As this was going on, a relief force of Maori, numbering around 400 warriors, led by the chief Wiramu Tamehana, appeared on the other side of the lake. But seeing the garrison surrender, they offered peace terms instead. General Cameron's official account very briefly says, Shortly after daylight on the 21st, the white flag was hoisted by the enemy of whom 183 surrendered unconditionally, gave up their arms, and became prisoners of war. Gamble said, At daylight, this, the mining of the parapet, was being done, when a white flag was hoisted by the enemy, and he surrendered unconditionally. 183 prisoners, with their arms and ammunition, of which latter they appeared to have a plentiful supply, fell into our hands. A veteran of the Nati Tama Oho tribe, told James Cowan in the 1920s that the main reason for the surrender was a lack of ammunition. The highest chief who remained in the pa, Takere Terao Anganga, spoke to the interpreter sent forward by the general and said, Peace shall not be made. In response to the summons to surrender, he declared, We will fight on. Then he made the request, Give us some gunpowder. He thought it would be fair play if the soldiers gave the Maori some powder to continue the fight with, but the interpreter said no. Takere and his people therefore decided to surrender. Given Gamble's and others' accounts of the defenders having plentiful ammunition, and them keeping a fire up all night long, it's fair to say that this account related 50 years after the battle may be incorrect. However, the embedded journalist who I've referred to earlier did have a different and more detailed story. About dawn, the breach was ready to be opened, and a party was told off for the forlorn hope. When everything was in readiness, a native appeared on the parapet showing a white flag, and was very much annoyed to find that no white flag was shown by our side, but that the troops gradually closed in and lastly got inside, whilst he was calling for an interpreter and waving the soldiers back, evidently wishing to make terms for himself and party. They were all very much surprised when they found that they must give up their arms and be considered as prisoners. Just as the white flag was shown from the redoubt, a large body of natives was seen on the opposite side of the lagoon, 
advancing along the ridge towards the field of battle. These turned out to be a force of 400 of the enemy under the command of William Thompson, who had, I believe, intended to have attacked the general in the rear, but perceived the white flag he also showed one, and sent messages to intimate that he gave himself up, but hearing that the garrison were prisoners he thought better of it, and only sent his merit to the general as a token that he submitted. Had the garrison been able to hold out an hour longer, it's probable that a grand engagement would have taken place. Maury accused the British army of abusing the flag of truce, as rather than opening negotiations, the troops had poured into the redoubt and demanded unconditional surrender. It seems to me that this has some validity. Had the garrison actually wished to give up fighting, they could have easily slipped away in the night, just as their wounded had, rather than offering unconditional surrender. I suspect the instincts of the journalist are correct. In my personal opinion, raising the flag of truce was a stalling tactic, necessitated by the imminent breach of their defences. It was a stratagem to buy time for the relief force to arrive, and then catch the British troops between the garrison and Tamehana's warriors. The journalist mentioned that the relief force was sighted at the same time as the white flag was raised. So that may have been apparent to the British officers. Hence the troops rapidly entered the redoubt and demanded the unconditional surrender, giving the garrison no choice but to accept. And Tamehana would have been a fool to attack the British while they occupied the trenches of the Pa without the fire from the garrison there to suppress them. The consequences of this battle were dire for Waikato Maori. Several prominent chiefs were captured amongst the 183. The prisoners were taken to the church in Rangaruri village, then transported down the river in the Pioneer, marched from the Mangatafari to Auckland, and then temporarily housed aboard the HMS Curaçao, then the Hulk Marion, and then ending up on Gray's private island, Kalau Island, where they escaped in September the following year too late to play a part in the defence of the Waikato. British forces would push southwards without resistance and occupy Narawahia, the capital of the Maori king. A huge defensive line was constructed further south at Patarangi, Pico Pico and Ohaupo to stop further British advances, and it had been argued that Rangaruri was only held in order to buy time for this to be completed. But that's a topic for another video. The numbers for the casualties vary a bit depending on the source. Cameron's report had 45 killed and 83 wounded. Gamble's had 40 killed and 92 wounded. 36 Maori were found dead, and an unknown number were killed trying to escape from the swamp. Rangaruri ultimately earned General Cameron a knighthood, and the Waikato War ultimately resulted in the occupation and eventual confiscation of a large swathe of the Waikato, 1.2 million acres of land ready for the colonial government's settlement plans. Today, the modern township of Rangaruri spans the battlefield. The site of the central redoubt is a reserve, with a written interpretation of the battle. The remains of a later armed constabulary redoubt, built by the men under Major Wirumu Te Feoro, occupies the high point where the 40th Regiment fired upon the retreating defenders of Rangaruri Pa. Heritage New Zealand provides a smartphone app, with recorded interpretation of the sites for visitors. A sizable section of the main line of the power was destroyed, without archaeological investigation, when the original State Highway 1 was constructed. An area near where the 40th began their amphibious assault has been archaeologically excavated, revealing evidence of the later British Commissariat Redoubt at the site, as well as Maori occupation before the war. A new state highway has now removed a large section of the main trench near where the 65th broke the line in the main assault, but I don't have any results from that project yet. I hope you found this video interesting. Military history is a passion of mine, and I'd love to do more videos like this. As I get better at doing videos, I may revisit Rangari Pa in greater detail, as I really want to do a site like this justice. Thanks for watching, and please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers!